in Maimorim Lakutim Beit. Now, I also found where this is, but I'm going to have to, God willing, after the class, I'm going to talk to you, Yerachmiel, or maybe Chaim, and you'll tell me how to put this up, how to, to do it, uh, how to put the Mimer up so that everybody can see it, the Mimer, the Sicha. Okay, here we go. We're in, we're in, uh, it's a Mimer, which is a, on Yud base Yud Gimel Tammuz, and it's called Hashem Li Beozrai. Where is this Mimer? One second. Hashem Li Beozrai. Here it is. Hashem Li Beozrai. It is on page Nunhe, which translates into 55. Nunhe in Mimer Malakutim Beit of the Rebbe. Good morning, everyone. All right, ready? Yes. Let's learn. Wonderful. Okay, if you want to, you want to try to put it up on the screen, that would be very nice. Yeah, I'm just looking for it. Oh, wonderful. If you go to Chabad in, what is it now? Uh, Otsar 770, you go into the Maimorim of the Rebbe, and then you go into Malukut Beit, and there it is, it's on page 55. What's it called? It's called Havaya Li Beozrai. It starts. The website. You have it? What's the website called? Uh, I went last night and I found it on Otsar 770. O T Z A R, O Aleph, Sadik, O Sar, Aleph Vav Sadik Resh, O Tsar Chabad, O Tsar 770. I'm sorry. All right, so let me give you a little bit of history over here. What's happening? <clears throat> the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was born in in Russia, and he was born in 1880 in Russia. When he was 40 years old, he took over the Chabad movement. His father passed away. That was in 1920. 1920 was when the, the communists were really started to consolidate their power. They had been victorious in the in the Russian Revolution and like whatever it was 1917 or whatever. And um, the, the communists were really starting to, to, to bear down to the degree where, the, you know, Chabad, Hasidut in general is, is, is a history of war. It's a history of war. As soon as the Baal Shem Tov came on the scene, immediately all of, you know, <clears throat> can we call it normative Judaism sprung up the Talmud Chachamim and say, and they couldn't understand what this idea that everybody is holy and everyone has to do tshuva. And, and when the Alter Rebbe came, the first Rebbe of Chabad, then it really started, especially after he wrote the book, the Tanya. And the first Rebbe of Chabad, he had enemies from all sides. All the other Hasidim didn't like him. And a Napoleon for sure didn't like him. He made a war against Napoleon. And the... Um, the the Russian government, the Tsarist government, even though they gave him, uh, because of his help in the war, they gave him a certificate. But still, they were they were Christians. They wanted to to take over all of Judaism, so they were his enemies. And the Misnagdim for sure were his enemies. The Jews that opposed him, they put him into prison. Okay. The, pre, the nevertheless, Chabad had fought all these battles and battles and battles, but. When it came to the, the, the Rebbe Rishab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, Rebbe Sholem Dovber, he said, I could fight all these battles, everything, but the, against communism, I can't. I haven't got the power. And he gave that over to his son, and that was the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he fought against communism. Now, communism, they say that, that Stalin killed approximately 50, 50, 5 0 million of his own people. Some say more, some people say less. 
50 million of his own people, all in the name of progress and justice and, you know, the most wonderful sayings in the world. And everyone adored Stalin. Even in Israeli kibbutzim, Shomer HaTzeir, there were pictures of Stalin, Shemesh Lamim, he is the illuminator of the world. Everybody, in that, and, he, and meanwhile, he was killing people, making all these purges. By him, public number, public enemy number one were the Shnersinskis. That was what Chabad was called. They were called Shnersinskis after the Rebbe. And the Rebbe refused in any way to be <clears throat> frightened by Stalin. Of course, he, he had to be normal. You couldn't walk around on the streets and, and preach Judaism. But he made underground schools were called Bamachteret, underground schools where there usually were no more than five boys learning. And they would, they would learn really in basements and they would close all the windows and they wouldn't come out for days, even longer weeks. And they had to sneak food in and, and said, and only in order to spread out Torah. And they caught a lot of Hasidi Chabad and they killed a lot of them and they put them in prison. And finally, they put the Rebbe in prison. And this was in the middle of the month of Sivan, in the year 1927. <clears throat> and then there started an outcry, a world outcry. Now Stalin at this time, this was just 1927, even though he was killing people right and left, but he wanted to make a good impression on the world. He wanted the world to think that he was, you know, for progress, and this was, and then he was succeeding, and, and he was kind, and that he was really, you know, manifesting all of these wonderful sayings of communism. There was finally going to be equality and there was going to be justice and there was going to be the, the simple man would have, you know, the, the food on his table and opportunity, brotherhood. And so we wanted everybody to think. So it ended up that because of that, the Rebbe eventually was freed. But the, who were the people who put the Rebbe in prison? Those were Jews. Those were Jews. There was a, a, a the, the, the Jewish section called the Yevtsekzia, the Jewish section of the KGB, or whatever it was in there, the GPO, they were all different names they had. There it is. Is this it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, let's see. Go on, down, down. The, the head of what Rob was, it was Gaganovich, who was a Kohai. Who? I'm sorry? The head of, a, the head of uh, Stalin's... Uh, the, I mean, he was Gaganovich, who was a Kahai. He was a? He was the head, the head of uh, the KGB. KGB. His yeah, name was Gaganovich. Gaga could have been. I, I, I'm not yeah, really yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. the whole thing, but the people that, that imprisoned the Rebbe was a fellow called Lulov, and then there was his friend was called uh, Nachmanson. There it is. No, 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 too far down. Too, what are you doing? Too far down. Go back up, 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 up. No, that's not it. It's not it. This is on page. I don't know if that was the right book. Oh, 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 oh. There it is. No, not it. This is not the right book. No, no, this is not the right, not the right safer. This should be Maimur Milakutim Bait. All right, let me go on a little bit with this history lesson and then we will keep trying to find it. Maimur Milakutim Bait. See here. Maimur Milakutim Bait. And here is the page. This is what the page should look like. Here, look the uh, the uh, table of contents. See, mafteach, table of contents. There it is, and this is the memory you're looking for here. Page 50. Is this too, is it clear? Oh, anyway, that's it. Okay, you can try to find it. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, here it is. Kuntris Chag Geula Yud Gimel Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamus Tavshin Mem Zion. All right, and the Rebbe was arrested on the 15th day of uh, this, and he was sentenced to death immediately. He was supposed to have been killed that very night. And there was some sort of a mix-up. You can read about it. There's a, a, even a part, there's Likuti Diburim that the Rebbe wrote, and there's one whole section that's called Masechet Gehenom, Tractate Hell. And the Rebbe talked about what happened to him when he was in the KGB. They put him in this, uh, in this prison, which is in uh, Leningrad. And they put him in this prison uh, called, what was it, Lublinka Prison. And he was sentenced to death. And there was some sort of a mix-up. And he went down the wrong room or something like that. And went down the wrong hall. 
And, and you can read about it, what happened over there. And, and he wasn't killed that night. And because he wasn't killed that night, in order for the instructions to come, it took a lot of time and he ended up he wasn't killed. So eventually they called him into, into uh, <clears throat> interrogation. And he saw on the table, there was, and there's a lot of stories that are involved where they put the gun to his head and he said, I'm not afraid of your gun. He saw on the table that it was written the, his name, and under that it was written death by firing, by, by, by uh, revolver, by, by shooting. And then there was crossed out and written yet. And then it was written, uh, what, five years or 10 years, I don't remember, 10 years in Kostroma. And then it was written five years, uh, three years, three years in Kostroma. Kostroma is the city way over in the, what is it, Ural Mountains or someplace, way over to the, was it the Eastern? Hmm side of uh, Russia, you know, near the China and all that. So he was given, here's something very interesting that we can, we can learn this, and then we'll see if we can try, try to find the mimer, if not. He was actually given the, the, his freedom was given to him on Thursday, which was the first day of Rosh Chodesh. It was, it was Lamed uh, Sivan. And they even said to him that he could go back home for, because it was right, right there in Leningrad. That's where his parents, that's where his family lived. He could go into the back home and he could stay there for six hours. And then he could take a, they had to take a train and go to his place of exile. Which was basically a very, it was, it was a city. It was a, a very large town, whatever you want to call it. Kostroma. You can look it up and you can see pictures of it. But still it's far away, far away. And you had to, and you were in exile when you were there. there. You were always under supervision. So he said, I'll go home. I'll take the train. You have to take a train. You have to be there. If, if, he said, well, I'll take the train. When will I arrive? He said, you'll arrive on Shabbat. Now that was a trick by this Lulav. Lulav was still the, he was still his supervisor in the prison. And he said, uh, he arranged it so that the Rebbe would have to travel on Shabbat. He was blazing mad. He wanted the Rebbe to be murdered, to be killed. It was blazing mad that they, were, they kept changing his, the lessening his sentence. And finally, the Rebbe said, um, I'm staying in prison, which was the first time, and I'm certain the last time, that anyone of his own free will stayed in that Russian prison. Because every moment that he was there, it was... And he was in danger of being killed. There was absolutely no, uh, no one over this fellow Lulav in the prison. He could have killed him in a moment. Anybody could have killed anybody else. There was no uh, observation, no laws or anything like that. Yeah, he could have killed him and said it was an accident that happened. And they did beat him up. They, they beat him up in such a way that it could have been fatal. And nevertheless, the Friedrich Rebbe said he's not, going to, he's not going to leave. Well, maybe we'll learn a sikh about that. Why it was. And that's what it was. And the Rebbe stayed there over Shabbos, in this prison, over Shabbat. And he, uh, on Yom Rishon, which was Gimel Tammuz, that's when the Rebbe was freed. And then the Rebbe was sent to this place called Kostroma. And, uh, and there was still pressure from the world. And he was freed on, uh, you know, nine days later. Practically, he was freed. But in fact, the offices there were closed. It was some sort of a holiday. And he only got the papers to be freed the day after, which was Yud Gimel Tammuz. So we celebrate Yud Base and Yud Gimel Tammuz. Why do we celebrate? What's the big thing? Oh, we're Chabad, you know, was our Rebbe, our teacher. Okay, first of all, you have to understand something very important. What is, what is Chabad in general? What is Chabad? A, a very, this is a one-minute lecture. What is Chabad? The first Jew was a person called Abraham. Abraham stood against the whole world. Why? Did he stand against the whole world? He was, why was he the first Jew? What did he do to be the first Jew? So the answer is Abraham realized that there's a creator and that this creator is creating everyone. And he's creating everyone with love. And the greatest gift that he's giving to everybody, and of course, life is a gift and consciousness is a gift and your eyes, your nose, your mouth is a gift. But the biggest gift that there is, is responsibility. And that every human being is responsible to the Creator. And there's, of course, the seven Noahide commandments for the non-Jews. And the, 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 in those days, there were no Jews. He was the only Jew. 
says, Abraham, he came to understand the commandments, the 613 commandments on his own. Why? Because his desire was so strong that he wanted to serve the creator. He realized that there's a creator and to serve him. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, yes, this is it. Is this it? No. No. Yeah, one second, one second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got, I got the wrong thing. Yes, yes, this is it, huh? Yes, good, this is it. All right. <clears throat> so Abraham realized that there's a God and the God gives everybody responsibility and then everyone, everyone, Jew and non-Jew, Abraham preached only to non-Jews. Everyone is a responsibility to make the world a better place. The Shevet Yitzhak to improve the world. What does it mean better? To believe in the Creator, to act accordingly, and that way will fix up what Adam messed up when he ate from the tree, which is the mimer we just previously learned about how we brought death into the world. And we learned in the end of that mimer what's going to happen to the non-Jews when there's the raising of the dead. Argument between Rabbi Hanin and Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So that was Abraham. Abraham was here in order to tell the Goyim, and even he was so ingrained in his soul to impress the non-Jews because they're part of God's creation. They're impressed the non-Jews that God even changed his name. Avraham means the father of all of the nations. Avraham. Avhamon Goyim. Rashi says uh, the Kalo Olam Kulo. So Abraham was really responsible for the whole entire world and the whole entire world is responsible for Hashem. And that's what the Jewish people are chosen for. We're the chosen people. God chose us to tell the Goyim how much God loves them, how he cares for them. He doesn't love them like the Jews, but love is a word that's understandable. Not understandable. Why? Because he gives every single non-Jew responsibility and uniqueness. Right? All this, every snowflake is different, for sure. Every non-Jew is different. Okay, so... This is the job. The only ones that took this on themselves to spread Judaism, first of all, to all the Jews and to all of the non-Jews, seven Noahide commandments, and to all of the world, physical world. It'll fix up everything. The whole world will be like it was before Adam ate from the tree, according to some of my more even higher. The whole world will be like the Holy of Holies. The only ones that took this crazy idea <clears throat> Chabad. Only ones. And the only ones that can do it in Chabad is the Rebbe. Without the Rebbe, we're like sheep without a shepherd. Right? We ever see sheep without a shepherd? No such thing. After a couple of days, they all get run over by cars, they run off a truck, they run off cliffs, and wolves eat them up. You have a shepherd, everything. The Jewish people would have never left Egypt if it wasn't for Moshe. They wouldn't, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wouldn't have gotten the Torah. They for sure would not have entered the land of Israel. You have to have Moshe. You don't have Moshe, everybody settles in. They worship the golden calf. So therefore, when the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, defying communism, he was basically defying all of the forces in the world that oppose Hashem. Communists had this big saying, Boga Nyet, God doesn't exist. No God. We're going to fix the world up ourselves. It's going to be one people, everyone will be equal. And, so, and it worked, actually. Communism worked. They made everybody equally poor, everybody equally miserable also. So came the, 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 the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and his freedom is basically the freedom of Abraham. It's the freedom of Judaism. It's the freedom of the purpose God created the world for. But in order to do this, he had to be tremendously brave and he had to risk his life, like Abraham did. Okay, let's learn the mime. Ready? Hashem li Ozrai said King David. David, now King David had a lot of trouble. You ever read the book of Tehillim? I advise you that uh, if you can, every day translate a little bit of Tehillim. I also advise everybody that every, every day you should go through the prayer davening and translate five minutes, just sit and translate, write the meaning of the words by an, a sitter, write the English meaning of the words over, the, you'll discover amazingly how many words you don't know, and how many, and when you do know them, you'll realize that the sentences don't make any sense, and that's when you pray, you're supposed to pray with 
understanding, but most important, prayer is supposed to be with your heart. It's supposed to be with your heart. That's the purpose of this Hasidut. But you come to okay, ready? Hashem li Bozrai, God is one of my helpers, Vanir Sibasanai, and I will see my I have this thing, I have this thing over here. Is, oh, maybe I can move here. Go. Hashem li Bozrai, God is one of my helpers, he's among my helpers, Vanir Besonai, and I will see revenge on my enemies. Anir E means I'll see them, I'll see them fall, I'll see them destroyed. Who said this? King David. This is in Psalm 118. The King David had a lot of trouble. A lot of troubles. King David was the Mashiach. Rambam says King David was the first Mashiach. And he had troubles from everybody. All sides, his family, his friends, his advisors. They wanted to kill him and they had to run away from him. Umedaya Kavit Kudush is Morichami. And the, the, now this is a mimer for yud based Tammuz, right? Umadayek and learns Kabbal Kedushet, his holiness, his, his honor, his holiness, Mori Chami, my father-in-law, my teacher, Adonina Mori Rabino, the previous Rebbe, in other words, Bala Simcha, the one whose happiness, whose party we're celebrating today, we're celebrating yud based Tammuz when he was released, a Simcha Gaula, it was his day of joy and, and release and redemption, that he said in this mimer. When did he say that? Sha'omar, that he said, Yud Beis Tam was a Rishon Tuf Reish Pei Zion. That he said immediately in Tuf Reish Pei Zion. Now, very interesting that the Rebbe, when they put the Rebbe into Kastroma, the first thing he did was say a mimer. The pre previous Rebbe, the whole time he was in prison and they were torturing him in this. Every opportunity he had, he would say a mimer. And when they released him, he said, a mimer, Tafresh Pei Zion is 1927. Shamash Mo'ut Alashan says the previous Rebbe, it seems from this King David, what King David said over here, doesn't seem to make any sense. I mean, King David was a very religious person. King David really believed in God. But in fact, that's what made him so much trouble that he believed in God. Right? He, he refused to make deals and he refused to flatter and he refused to this, right? but nevertheless he had a lot of enemies that wanted to knock him down. And here King David is saying, what's he saying? And this is, God is Be'ozrai, one of my helpers. King David is saying, God is one of my helpers. The mashmut, the lashon, the implication, the implication of this language of King David, that Hashem, li Ozrai, that God is to me, among my helpers who, sheyeshnam ozri machirim, that I've got a lot of helpers. Oh, bakasha he, and King David is requesting, right? You can learn this as a praise, or you can lose it. He's saying, God, please be among my helpers. Hashem, lib, Hashem, please be among my helpers. Shagam, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, also God, yeah, should be, bein ozrim, one of the helpers. Huh? All right. There's a lot of helpers. I mean, maybe you get help from outside. He can get help from his friends. Maybe, you know, if, if someone would take mercy on him. Says the Rebbe, what do, you, what do you mean? How can you say that? Ain't no movement. It's not understood. How he call Yisrael, all the Jewish people, not just King David, they believe in simple faith, if not a, in a revealed way, but every Jew believes it deep down inside, at least deep down inside. Shahu Yisbrech, the God, Levado alone, who Ozer Val Moshe Allah Adam, the God, He's the one that helps and He saves people, the calling, you know, in everything you do. You might forget this, you might not be aware of it, it might seem that it's not true, but every Jew believes that it's true. In fact, this is a thing that can only be grasped with belief, with faith. But in fact, that's the fact. It's just the world is so confusing and covering us, and there's so much static. We don't see what the truth is. The truth is, is that Hashem really loves us and He cares about us and He puts challenges before us and Hashem helps us. What do we say in our prayers every day? Melech, Oizer, Omoshia, Omogain. We say that God is a helper. He helps us and He saves us and He protects us. We say that every day. We say it three times a day.
Hashem is the one that does everything. That's what the Jews are. Hashem Echad, God is one. That's called unifying God. Good, let's say we don't know, uh, we don't feel it all the time, but it became David. Hech <laughs> Omar, how could King David say, Hashem Li, God is, should be with me, but Ozrai, among my helpers. The Mashmut Alashan implies that Yeshtam Ozrim Acherim, that there are other helpers. Shehem Ozrim Emitim, that they are the real helpers. But he just, he would just, David would rather that Hashem helped him, you know, just to make things 100%. Hashem mitztaref aleim, imam. He's asking that God should, that, that, that God should join, boop, boop, I'm sorry, what did I do? That, that God should join with them. The Gam, Surah Lab, we also have to understand the Bakasha, the request. What is King David saying? Vani Ereb is so nice that I should see my enemies. In other words, I should see the downfall of my enemies. Shiir Eh, that he should see Nekama, his revenge on his enemies. Says the Rebbe, that's not a nice thing to do. Come on, the, the whole purpose, what do we say is Judaism? That the whole world is supposed to worship Hashem, not the whole world is supposed to be destroyed. Or at first glance, Have Lei Levakesh, he should have requested Sha'oivim Vasonim that his enemies and those who hated him, Yafchulovim, God should transform them to be admirers, supporters, friends. Hagam, the Soneto, Shal David, even though that it's true that those who hated David, Hayato Rak Sone Hashem, they hated King David because they hated God. Kamosha Gatuv, like it says, I mean, what it was, how, how could that be? David is only a person. But people like it when God is up in heaven. A religious person, keep God in heaven and don't, don't, don't get too involved in the world. If God is up in heaven, then I can take it easy. That was why, how Korach drove all the Jews crazy. Korach said, leave God in heaven. Korach means a division. He wanted to divide. The upper worlds are the upper worlds. Let God stay up in heaven. And we're going to be, and Moshe said, no, 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 no. You have to be, God is here and everything you do everywhere. And every, and Korach said, listen, more, you're the best proof that God is not here. Who's telling you to say these things? And Moshe said, Hashem told me, lo me libi. I did not do it, it's Hashem. Korach said, look at, look, said to the Jewish people, look what we got over here. This is our leader. He thinks he's God. He thinks he's God. That's why they hated King David. They hated King David because they hated Hashem. Komosh Gatub, like it says, alo misanecha ani like it says, is it not so that those who hate you, I hate? It's another sentence in Tehillim. God is saying, those who hate you, King David, I'm sorry, is saying, those people who hate you, I hate. Those who hate you, God, I hate, says King David. Those people who war against you, those are the ones that I'm warring against. Nevertheless, Behold, it is written, it says that there should be destroyed all sins from the world, and not the sinners. Famous story with Rabbi Meir, right? The Rabbi Meir that is, had next door neighbors who were making him a lot of trouble. They were rioting, who knows what they were do, doing to him. And he prayed that they should die. I mean, they must have been pretty bad. And his wife said, it doesn't say that, they should, that the sinners should die. It says that the sins should die. Pray for them. And he didn't, and they became, they, they, they how do you say, they repented. So said that King David sure, certainly should have said that. True, he had terrible enemies. And they were murderous people. And they were nefarious and, and, and crooked and liars. And they were geniuses and they should have known better. Right? It was just pure jealousy. It, <clears throat> and all the bad attributes, and they were very powerful. And every second they were there was just a danger to King David. And they really hated him totally. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him, sure. But nevertheless, King David should have prayed that they would do tshuva. This is relevant to even those who hate God. Just like we saw, like we saw with all the, now the Rebbe is talking, just like we saw with all the Rebbe's of Chabad, and especially with the previous Rebbe. That he tried to, I say, be friendly 
and draw to Torah and mitzvahs, even those people should besuga meduba betanya perik lamad alav lamad beis besofel. Right? You ever read betanya perik lamad beis besofel? It explains over there the secret of how to love every Jew, even a, a Jew that really drives you crazy and he, he's totally against God, and he says it and he doesn't. Actually, should every. <clears throat> So the Rebbe says over there that there were Jews. King David said, The ultimate hatred, I hate them. He says, those are Jews who are really apikorsim. Jews that really know the whole Torah and they intend to go against it. Those people, David and Melech hated. Well, the previous Rebbe did not hate those people. So obviously it must be that King David also had it in him not to hate those people also. In any case, these people that put the previous Rebbe into prison, they were not Apikorsim. Apikorsim has to know the whole Torah. He has to be a, a genius. He has to understand everything and then go against God. These are just really low-life people. I have the, the, the picture went away. Uh, okay, well. Obemiuchad, and especially, what happened to the picture? The picture has disappeared. Obemiuchad, I'm reading from my book. Obemiuchad, and especially the Balagula Shekirvu Gam Elu, that he, he uh, what do you say, drew close, even those people that were really apikorsim, that were really. And he brought them to be better. If so, King David should have requested that these people. Should do tshuva. Umayo v'kasha v'anir abesonai. What does it mean? That king David said, "All I want is revenge." How could King David say a thing like that? Bait. Can you put the, the text back up again? Huh? Please. No. Huh? All right. Okay. I have my. Oh, here we go. Very good. Okay. Ola havin ze. In order to understand this. In the Makti, in the Mimer, it says in the Mimer. So we have two questions. First of all, how could King David say that God is among my helpers? He's among my helpers, or he's requesting that God should be among my helpers. And what does it mean that I want to see revenge on my enemies? Why did King David say that? Well, having said, to understand this, I mean, even more, let's say he felt it, he said it, he felt it. Why does he have to advertise it? King David wrote this in the book of Psalms for all generations. What is he trying to tell us that we should drive for revenge? Is that, there's a mitzvah in the Torah that says, Lo, lo takum. Lo takum, lo titor. It's forbidden to take revenge. King David is saying he wants revenge. Good. I mean, listen, they really want to get, like he says, they want to get the Hashem. These were the worst people, but still. Well, Lahabin said, to understand this, Maktim, but Mimer, he precedes in the Mimer. Masha, Omer, David, what's David said? And now we're talking about this is a Mimer that the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe said a couple of days, whatever, after he got out of imprisonment, after he got out of uh, the, the uh, exile in Kastroma. <coughs> he said this Mimer, or maybe on the very day that he got out. So he brings over there, the previous Rebbe brings what King David said. King David said, King David said, This is one of the sentences from the Rebbe's Mizmor, the Kufiyu test. Your laws were like music to me in the house of my wandering. When I was wandering around, your Torah was music to me. I got tremendous pleasure. It was my only pleasure. Shabbat Hayutu Novanada, the time when King David was wandering around, Metul Talba Gerut, and he was in exile. If you know the story about King David, especially when his son, his son Absalom, who was beautiful and he was handsome and he was talented and he was a genius and he was holy and he had everything. But he was jealous with, about his father, and he made war against King David, and he, King David had to run away from him. Also, King David had to run away from a lot of people. He had to run away from King Saul. and that's it. Anyway, King David said that 
your Torah, your laws were songs to me. It was my only comfort. The Beit Megorai when I was wandering around, running away from my enemies, running away from death. When I was running and wandering, metultal and how do you say, bothered in the gerus in my in my how do you say my exile, megure lashin gerus. Megure means gerus, wandering around, living in different places. Umale pachadim, and I was a, always afraid. Megure malashin magur bapacha. The word magur, ki agarti mifnei afa afa chema rot Moshe Rabbeinu said go. Gur means to, uh, afraid. Misonov and merodfav. From my enemies and from my those who pursuing me. King David, he had to run away. Obviously, he was afraid. He had to run away. He didn't say, oh, I'm just sitting here and let God protect me and I'm going to show them. King David was running away and his enemies were real enemies and they had him outnumbered, I don't know, 10 to 1, 100 to 1. Hayam mit aneg. Nevertheless, King David, he got pleasure of a simcha and joy Torah from the words of Torah. They were pleasant and sweet to him, Kamo just like songs and melodies. The Tzorach Lahav, and we have to understand, Hariyesh Riboy Mini Tainugim. There's a lot. David wants to compare Torah to something. What type of pleasure does he compare it to? To music. Says the Rebbe, there's a lot of types of things that there's a lot of things that give pleasure in the world. Maduam Adamid David a Tainug Shayalo. Why does David compare the pleasure that he got with the words of Torah to the pleasure of music? Music is such a great pleasure. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure for sure, but that, that's... We have to understand in the commandments, there are three types. What does David say? What does he say? Let's look back at the sentence again. David says, it says, what's the name? What is the point? Oh, Zmiros Hayuli Chukecha Babet Magurai. That's what King David said. Zmirot Hayuli Chukecha. Music was to me Chukecha, your Torah. Your Torah, he calls Chukecha. Now, says the Rebbe, there are three types of commandments. The Torah can be looked at as providing us three different types of commandments. One of the main purposes of the Torah is to know what to do. The Torah gives us there are three different types of commandments in Judaism. Interestingly enough, the only religion in the world which has commandments is the Jewish religion. Other religions have rituals, they have their practices, they have their heritage, they have their whatever it is. But the only religion that says that we are doing exactly what God told us to do, God himself told us to do, we're, that's what we're doing. That's Judaism. Now there's three types of commandments. There are commandments which are mishpatim. Those are understandable. There are commandments which are called edus. Those are religious commandments. And there are commandments which are called chukim, which they're not, they don't make any sense and they have nothing to do with religion. Like, for instance, example, don't forbidden to boil milk with meat. Boiling milk with meat is punishable. Boiling, not our eating. You boil milk with What could possibly be wrong with boiling milk and meat? What, what, what type of a religious, it shows something Jewish that you don't boil milk and meat together. This is a religious, what has this got to do with anything? It makes no sense. That's called a chok. Commandments that you do it only because that's what God wants. Mishpatim, Eidot, and Chukim. Mishpatim, these are the commandments that you have to do because they're logical. Like stealing, robbery, cheating, honoring your parents. Eidot, that's the second type. Eidot, these are commandments, mitzvot, shem, ot vizikaron. They are Eidot, they testify to something else. A religious commandment, this testifies that God took us out of Egypt. This testifies that, that uh, we received the Torah. This Oat v'zikron, Komo Shabbat, like Shabbat, that God created the world six days, rested, Pesach, Sukkah, Tefillin, 
these are signs of our religion that we believe. Right? The signs are something that happens. So, the Gam Mitzvot Eilu, these commandments also, they also have a place in intellect, right? Keeps the Jewish people going. We have our signs that unify us and we have our heritage. And it, it's a little bit logical. God took us out of Egypt. You know, why not eat the matzahs? We remember what the good things that God did. Hagam Shasechom Mitzaratzmo, even though that a person on his own, Lulei Tzibu, if it wasn't commanded in the Torah, would not obligate a person to put on tefillin or eat matzot or sit in a sukkah, the low mitzvot, not like the commandments which are mishpatim, shegam il mole nitna Torah. It says if the Torah were not given, we would learn these from animals. It says you could learn uh, tzniut, you could learn what is it called, modesty from a, 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 a cat, gezel from a namala. The cats, when they go to the bathroom, they cover it over. Ants, each ant has its piece of whatever it is. It doesn't throw it down and take a bigger piece from some other ant. But he sees an ant with a bigger piece of sugar or something. He spits his one out and goes over to the other one and steals it. Ants, they, so you learn from an ant not to steal. Be happy with what you've got. You can learn. In other words, there are these, how do you say, these uh, the, the, the characteristic, character traits of being honest and being, and being clean they're in nature. Yikomakom, nevertheless, la achasha Torah tziva. Even though we wouldn't have come on it to our, to our own, <clears throat> the commandments which are, like the, which those commandments which are mush, mishpatim, we could learn from a cat and from all of this. Those commandments which are edut, they don't make so much sense. But when the Torah tells us to do it, then it makes sense. Kama sechom maskim. I can agree to this. You eat matzah on Passover, don't eat chametz. And understand. Masha Enkim, which is not the case, Chukim, which are the commandments, which are called Chukim. Hey, mitzvahs, these are commandments. She'enam al pitam, that have no logic to them whatsoever. In fact, they oppose logic. They oppose logic. Right? A person that's a mamzer, he can never get married to a Jewish woman. That makes sense. Doesn't make sense. <clears throat> a lady whose husband runs away from her, she can never get married until they find out that he's dead or something like that. That makes sense. Doesn't make any sense. Why? There are a lot of commandments that make absolutely no sense. <clears throat> Those are, if you want to call purely godly commandments. We do it only because Hashem says to do it. Those commandments you do because God told me. And that's what King David said. Zemirut hayuli chukecha. Your chukim, those were songs. Those, that was music to me. Torah Lavin, if we have to understand, why did King David say zemirut hayuli chukecha? Hari, Peshut, it's obvious that the pleasure and the joy that King David had when he learned the Torah, it was in all the types of the Torah. The Kol Dinia Torah. The part of the Torah, especially that he could understand. Understanding the Torah, that's what gives you pleasure. Why does he say, Why did King David say, and King David was pretty much in the same situation as the previous Rebbe. Everyone was running after him. He was going to be killed. And he said, but don't worry, I, I still have pleasure from one thing. The Chukim are like songs to me. Music. Chukim? Chukim make no sense. Those are the commandments that have no logic to them whatsoever. That's what was music to King David. What about the other types of commandments? Why did King David say, but there must be a good reason that King David said it, and we're going to understand it uh, tomorrow. But let's do a couple more lines. The Indian who... Now this, by the way, this mimer is going to teach us how to deal with uh, difficulties. Everybody has difficulties in life. True, they're not as difficult as the previous Rebbe. And uh, even more so, the previous Rebbe was totally undeserving. He was a, a holy person, never did any sins, never lied, never cheated, only helped people, did Torah, mitzvahs all the time. Why did he get put into prison? Should have got put into prison, <clears throat> you know, 
the heads of the communists, the, the communists put him into prison. What did the Rebbe do to, to suffer? And the suffering was terrible suffering. It was terrible suffering. Even it was deserved. Only people who would have done the worst sit crimes deserved to suffer like that. Why did, and especially death. We punish him, punished by death. Death was in front of him. Why did he do it? So we can, we can learn from how the attitude of the previous Rebbe that we should also have that attitude because we're also religious people, right? I mean, we believe in Hashem. We believe in the Torah. We believe we're here for a purpose. We're, we're challenged by the world. The world is, is sometimes wins, gets us angry, gets us depressed, gets us this, this. So we're at a battle. We've got to fight battles. Is what, how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to maintain our attitude and maintain our power of defiance of the world? How can we do it? Well, maybe the example, the two examples are King David and the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. So let's see. It's like this. Zemiro tu inyan shebach. And that which King David said, that your Torah was like music to me, said the Rebbe, this word music, zmirot, means music, but the word zmirot is also a praise of God. Like it says in the Tanya, the Masha David Korah the Divrei Torah, that that which David called the words of Torah, zmirot, songs, who in Yen Shivcha Daraisa, the King David was praising the Torah. Shadavid Ayim Shabbat the Torah Bazen, the King David was praising the Torah in this. What was he praising the Torah in this? Shachayut Kol Olamot, that the life of all of the worlds, was everything you see over here all of the communists and all their prisons and all their ideas and all the problems they're making for me, everything, the whole entire creation depends on one little detail of the Torah. The world is created from the Torah. <coughs> <coughs> Therefore, he's praising the Torah, that the Torah, you are a beautiful song, a beautiful symphony. This entire world is just part of the <coughs> symphony. And it's true, maybe we don't understand <clears throat> everything that's going on, but still, you read the Torah and you realize there's something really amazing and deep going on here. The whole thing is just a beautiful music. Why? Because the Torah makes sense of it. <clears throat> that's the praise. I'm praising the Torah. What's the 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 Pirush the the Pirush Apashut and the connection between this and the simple meaning Zmiros Hayalichukecha that King David is praising the Torah. And on the other hand, King David is saying the Torah makes me feel good. It comforts me. And so is he saying what the Torah does for me? It makes me feel good? Or is he just praising the Torah and itself? Torah, you are greater than all of the worlds. You create the world. Anything in the world can't compare to the Torah. That's how it explains the idea of, of Zmirot, songs. Is he praising the Torah? Or is he just saying how the Torah gives me Comfort. What's the connection between the two of them? The al yidei by means of it bonanuk b'maylat of shevach haTorah by means of contemplating the greatness and the praise of the Torah. Shakala olamot that all the worlds are negated to one little detail of the Torah. And there was the Torah is infinitely more important and real than all the worlds. I'm praising the Torah by means of that. Paul Ba'atzmo, he could bring upon himself Shakolin in the Olam, that nothing in the world can have a bad effect on him. Gam Keshahoya Loto Vagashmius, even when it was bad to him physically, Haya Osaka Torah, the fact that he knew words of Torah, when he learned Torah, it made him happy. So he was both of the things. He was praising the Torah, that the Torah is infinitely greater than anything in the world, 
And he was also saying the Torah does for me, makes me happy. He linked both of these things together, King David. What's that going to do with us? We'll talk about, God willing, tomorrow. Why does he use, <clears throat> why does he use the, the analogy of, of music for both of these ways of looking at it? Whether he's praising Hashem, or whether he's referring to the way it affects him. I mean, he could have said simcha. He could, what, is the, what is the connection specifically of music to these two points? He's praising Hashem because every, every little thing, every dictuk in the Torah. So why is that specifically the, what he's using music? In the Tanya, it seems that what's he saying like this. First of all, it says over there, Zemiro Sayoli, that King David got punished because he said this. <clears throat> he got punished. Why? Because God says, Hashem said, Zemiros, Zemiros Kurulahan, you're calling the Torah songs. <clears throat> what was King David trying to say? King David was trying to say that, that uh, um, the Torah is making order in the world. The Torah is creating the world. The Torah is infinitely greater than the world, and it's making harmony in the world. Mm -hmm. The whole world is being created by Hashem. So here you see, he's, here's Haman, and here's Stalin, and here's this, and evil. It's all being created by Hashem. It's all part of this amazing symphony, because the Torah is infinitely greater than the world. Don't look at the world. Look at the Torah. The Torah is infinitely, infinitely more real than what we think it is, the Torah creates the world and it makes harmony in the world. And Hashem said, that's the biggest praise you can make from the Torah. The Torah is infinitely greater than that, that it creates the world. Okay, that's what the Tanya says. Right? He explains. But nevertheless, that's the idea that the Torah put this amazing meaning into everything that's happened. It's amazing that they're... It's almost, let's say, like a person goes and... He, let's take a simple example of a person. He says, uh, you know... <clears throat> His wife leaves him, his wife steals all of his money, and he gets sick, and he has to leave, and somebody steals his house, and all this. And he goes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, why is all this happening to me? And the rabbi says, listen, this is the best thing that could possibly happen to you, man. You're a Jew. Your wife was not Jewish, right? The, 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 she was, she's a, a criminal. They were going to use the house for criminal activities. If another minute the police would have come and arrested you, they would have put you in jail. The, all of a sudden, he goes to the rabbi. The rabbi makes sense of the whole thing. Right? It makes sense. Right? It's like saying the Mashiach. What's the greatness of Mashiach? That he's going to make sense of all the pain and suffering that we had. Right? That's a Mashiach. It's true, Mashiach is going to do it. It's an amazing thing. But that's Mashiach. Mashiach is going to reveal Hashem in the world. He's going to reveal. Right? All you're thinking about is that Mashiach is just going to take away my troubles and pains. The good he's going to do that. But that's small change for Mashiach. That's small change. That even the suffering of Jewish suffering is not a small thing. But nevertheless, the main thing of Mashiach is that he's going to reveal godliness in the world. The same thing the Torah. The main thing of the Torah is that's the essence of God. What are you saying? You're praising the Torah because it makes order in the world. You understand? So, so, the, so the, 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 um, <clears throat> the comparative or the analogy of music is the, the, detail, the, the detail that makes the music, the detail of the Torah is... The whole world, in other words, the whole symphony depends on the detail of every single note. Right. And it, the Torah is like the conductor. The Torah right. is like the conductor of the whole world, right? And that makes sense of the whole world. And therefore, when I learn the Torah, that makes my suffering easier. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Good? Good. Thank you. Now we're going to continue the 